thank you all for, uh, for joining us this evening for the June installment of uh, the Alcune Society virtual lecture series. Uh, my name is Spencer Stewart. I'm uh, one of the executives on the Alcune Society board. Uh, before we get started uh, this evening with Richard Hopkins' uh, uh, talk, I just want to sort of give a little background of the Alcune Society. Uh, it was founded in 1965. And the Alcune Society is the only nonprofit organization in Canada that's dedicated to the entire range of interests related to books and reading. Uh, Amphora, the Society's journal, is published three times per year and covers topics that include authorship, publishing, book design and production, the history of the book, libraries, ephemera, book selling. Uh, really, the list uh, sort of goes on uh, typography, type design, paper making. Uh, to further its aims, the Alcuin Society engages in a wide range of educational activities, uh, such as the talks that we're providing, um, or, you know, on a monthly basis. But we also, uh, you know, uh, you know, in person, we, we host uh, lectures and workshops, exhibitions, and uh, the occasional field visit uh, with various institutions across the country. Um, the Alcuin Society Annual Awards for Excellence in Book Design in Canada is the only national composition of, competition of its kind that recognizes and celebrates uh, the art of the book, uh, of book design in Canada. And winners of this award represent the nation at the international exhibition, uh, exhibitions and competition in Frankfurt and Leipzig uh, annually. And as well, the society offers the Robert R. Reed Award and Medal to recognize lifetime achievement in or the extraordinary contributions to uh, the book arts in Canada. So if you're, if you're not a member of the society, we, we encourage you to visit our site uh, and, and becoming one today. Our, our website is simply www.alcuinsociety.com. And I'll put a link in the chat um, uh, this evening as well. Um, th this evening and really the, the whole programming uh, that has been set up uh, could not have happened without Gina Page, the uh, programming director for the Alcuin Society. So uh, really a thank you to her for putting all these, this great list together of, of people, including uh, Richard's talk this evening and, and guys uh, from last month. Um, so without further ado, uh, I'll hand it over to Guy Robertson to make the introductions to uh, Richard Hopkins for this evening. Again, thank you very much for... Uh, for, uh, for coming in this evening. And, uh, and if you have any questions during the talk, please uh, put them in the, the chat and, uh, and we'll address them uh, afterwards. Thank you very much and uh, over to you, Guy. Thanks very much, Spencer. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce this evening's speaker, uh, Dr. Richard Hopkins, who has spent much of his life in the world of books. He has been a school teacher, a school librarian, uh, a business librarian, and his name uh, still echoes through the hallways of certain uh, buildings in Calgary, office towers in Calgary. Uh, he has been a uh, public librarian, an academic librarian, uh, and a freelancer and consultant. Uh, he has used his wide experience to take uh, a PhD in Library and Information Studies at the University of Toronto, after which he taught at the University of British Columbia's School of Library, Archival and Information Studies for more than 20 years. His former students remember him fondly uh, and they have made careers all over North America, Europe and Asia. They recall his excellent advice uh, regarding, and here I quote, budget allocating, uh, intelligent acquisitions and what one student uh, who will probably remain nameless called uh, avoiding idiocy in the workplace. Um, this uh, was a, a popular uh, course that um, Richard taught in uh, management of libraries. Um, he uh, has uh, become or did become one of the more popular professors in uh, uh, SLACE and uh, following his retirement in 2005, uh, he started a uh, successful, now uh, successful uh, used book business, uh, which flourishes to this day. This evening, he will give us uh, an overview of the novel in woodcuts, a topic that is increasingly relevant in this age of graphic fiction. So without further ado, I'll hand over uh, Zoom to Richard. Thank you very much, Guy. 
Uh, of course, uh, one one has to warn uh, that a PhD stands for permanent head damage, and I'm a good living example of that. Uh, but I'll do my best. I will just start by saying that as a as a seller, but now no, notice George Walker is in the audience, and he is uh, Canada's foremost uh, wood engraver and wood wood cut wood novelist, uh, wordless novelist. So it's great to see him there. Um, yeah, as a seller of used books, I, many interesting ideas come across my desk on a, almost a daily basis on the areas for book collecting. Now, I have to put most of those aside because of, of course, budgetary limits, but even more important limitations of space. Once in a while, however, I simply must, this all does lead up to the wordless novel, by the way. Uh, once in a while, I simply must ignore all these limitations and begin collecting in a new area of interest. So for example, I have one collection of what I, and I'm sure others, call oddball books. You often see these books when passing by a used bookstore. Um, the owner of the store strategically places these books in the window to capture the attention of those passing by. I'm talking about books uh, like um, um, Everything Men Know About Women. And of course, it's it's blank all the way through. Um, as is the complete book of blank verse. Well, of course, it's blank all the way through. What else would it be? Uh, yeah. Okay. One, another one. Uh, just a few examples here. Uh, odd jobs. It's called. And my favorite uh, odd job is on the cover. It's called um, uh, Aroma tester. Uh, that's that's her job. Uh, some of the books uh, that are oddball books are they're not really odd unless you have an odd sense of humor. But I always I found this one quite funny. I bought it off a book stall for maybe a dollar. Getting getting the most out of your lathe. Getting the most out of your, yeah, getting the most out of your lathe. That just strikes me as funny. The next one is funny because uh, of Monty Python. They invented a wine called Chateau de Wagga Wagga in Australia. And I, I, I have a book here called A History of Wagga Wagga. And that just struck me as a odd book and one I wanted in my collection. And the last is um, this one I often display in my living room. Um, it's called My Family Album, and it has a chimpanzee on the cover, and so I leave it strategically in my front room, um, just for fun. Now, another collection that I have derives in my interest uh, in the novel as a literary form. Um, the great majority of novels tell a story exclusively relying on uh, linear prose text. However, one prose novel I have, State of Emergency, fancies itself a programmed entertainment. Um, it lets the reader decide at various points in the narrative which of several paths to take. Uh, probably a good thing that this very vari variation in approach to the structure of the novel pretty well failed to catch on, thank goodness. Another variation is the novel. No, this is the one. The state of state of emergency. Uh, uh, don't worry, I have uh, slides for everything else, but uh, for these, I didn't think it was worth it. Um, another variation in the novel is is one solely written in verse, so one that relies again on um, language to tell the story, but laid out differently on the page. An example here is Vikram says. The Golden Gate. And a friend of mine, coincidentally, told me the other day that he, when you're reading that novel in verse, you forget that it's in verse. He said, uh, try it, try it. Uh, several novels stand between the prose novel and today's graphic novel. A number of these examples experiment by arranging pages of visual images interspersed with the prose text. 
A few of these are Jack Finney's Time and Again, which uses black and white photographs. Jacqueline Carey's Wedding Pictures, uh, which uses full color paintings. And Carolyn Preston's The Scrapbook of Frankie Pratt, which uh, uses uh, page after page of black and white and color uh, memorabilia. Of course, we all know that the form that eventually dominated the market is the graphic novel, a form that fully integrates textual and graphic material. And of course, two very famous examples here are Arch Spiegelman's Mouse and Chester Brown's Louis Riel. Now, at the opposite extreme to the prose novel is the subject of tonight's presentation, variously called the, the novel in woodcuts or the wordless novel. Or, as I mean, I've, I've sort of collected these as I've done my research. Wordless books, novels without words, woodcut novel, novels and pictures. Uh, one of the most famous um, uh, artists in the genre called them pictorial narratives, and uh, some have called them the original graphic novels. Now, um, to go back to the beginning, to give a bit of history, I think it's good to know where these came from. You have to go to the Expressionist period in Europe. Not quite yet. <laughs> My son's waiting to turn the images on. The Expressionist period uh, in, um, influenced poetry, painting, printmaking, architecture, theater, dance, film, and music. It was a modernist movement originating in Northern Europe around the beginning of the 20th century. Its typical tray was to present the world solely from a subjective perspective, distorting it radically for emotional effect in order to evoke moods or ideas. Expressionist artists have sought to express the meaning of emotional experience rather than physical reality. And I'm going to show you an image and you'll recognize it right away. I promise you. Expressionism refers to an artistic style in which the artist seeks to depict not objective reality, but rather the subjective emotions and responses that objects and events, uh, events aroused within a person. Now, we're not going to deal with all of the arts in, uh, in, in Expressionist, uh, in, ex in ex the Expressionist period. We're going to focus on graphic art, and that will lead to uh, the wordless novel. Expressionist graphic art was developed in ways that broke radically from previous convention, uh, conventions in portraiture. Up to this point, artists often use more realistic a more realistic style to paint things as they were. However, German Expressionist artists broke down the notion of objective forms by distorting realistic images, by using heavy lines, bold flat patterns, or more geometric forms. These pieces not only provided a subjective point of view, but often caricatured key political events or social policies that emerged in the rapid expansion of the time uh, and the rapid expansion of the city life. The first of these graphic methods and the oldest is woodcutting. As the name suggests, by etching into wood, individuals could create heavy lines and very bold geometric forms. Uh, this method uh, could be used to create striking posters or other forms of political art. And now I'll get my son to turn the images on. hard to see the keys. Okay, that's better. And this is uh, left and right. Yeah. Okay, there's the first uh, image. It's by Emile Nolde, and it's called The Prophet. And I think it refers back to my uh, statement about um, 
the influence of biblical uh, woodcuts and woodblock books. Um, so it's a good example um, to start with. Oops, which way do I go? Right. Huh? Right. Yeah. It's not going. Oh, right. Okay. The second one is by the most, uh, there are three, the three most famous wood, wordless novelists or woodcut novelists are Franz Mesril. I checked that online, the pronunciation. Uh, and um, Lindward and our own George Walker here in Canada. Lindward was from the United States. But this is a maze reel, uh, not, not from a um, wordless novel, but just one of his prints. And it's called Arise Ye Dead, because the First World War had a, a, a huge emotional impact on um, artists. Uh, OK. This next one is Otto, by Otto Dix, and it's called Stormtroops Advance Under Gas. And again, it's a World War I image. This one is called The Savior. And of course, it's Adolf Hitler, but it was done in 1930. So this was when he was um, rising up politically in the country. Uh, someone They were already uh, caricaturing him at, at that point. And the, the last one I think you'll recognize, The Scream by Edvard Munch. And again, you can see the distortion and it's done with a uh, woodcut. I believe it's woodcut, not a wood engraving, or it's a painting actually. This one's a painting because uh, we're not dealing at this point just with uh, woodcuts and wood engravings. Now, apparently, I have to leave this image up because it's too complicated uh, to uh, switch back and forth. But I turn now to the novel and woodcuts or the wordless novel. The novel and woodcuts uh, is a narrative genre that solely uses sequences of expressive images to tell a story. The genre flourished primarily in the 1920s and 30s in Europe and was most popular in Germany. However, as we will see, there are some very impressive examples of practitioner, practitioners of this art from both the United States and from Canada. This typically social activist art form drew inspiration from medieval woodcuts, uh, often used in what were called block books dealing with religious themes. The woodcut novelist used the awkward look of that medium to express angst and frustration at social injustice. I mean, there are days I actually feel like this myself. Socialist themes against capitalism and social oppression were common in uh, these um, works. Now, the great master, and again, I, I had to look up the pronunciation. Uh, it was a one of those horrible translation things with a very horrible voice, but at least it gave me an idea uh, how to pronounce it. And uh, according to them, it's Franz Masril, uh, was a, a Masril, was a Flemish speaking Belgian who, whose first artistic work was for pacifist magazines such as Le Feuille in Geneva, Switzerland and Lumiere in Antwerp, Belgium where he produced both woodcuts for decorative pieces for magazines and also uh, woodcuts to illustrate articles. And he drew political cartoons. He spent most of his artistic life in France, Switzerland, and latterly Germany. During his long artistic career, he produced, according uh, to commentator uh, critic uh, David Barona, over 50 wordless books. Now, I don't think anyone else has achieved that uh, number. His first work in the genre was Images of a Man's Passion, which was issued in 1918, consisting of 25 woodcuts. 
On top of that, of course, I must be remembered that not only did he produce 50 wordless books, but during his long and prolific career, he also created many woodcut illustrations for books and magazines and book jackets and political cartoons. His influences consisted of medieval woodcuts, including religious block books, and significantly enough, expressionist silent films of the period, such as Fritz Lang's Metropolis, Robert Wien's The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, and F.W. Murnau's Nosferatu. After all, these silent the silent films of the era tell a story by the use of graphic moving images only. And we'll be seeing, uh, I'm going to show you um, Mezril's first uh, graphic uh, wordless novel for two reasons. One, it's it started the whole thing, but the other one is it's only 25 images long. I didn't feel I had time to show you a wordless novel that was 80 to 100 images long, so I had to be practical. A direct quote from Israel provides a definite clue to the themes you see in his work. Since my time of youth, I have protested against the society in which I am living. The social injustice seemed odious to me, and I believe this early rebellion became the source of many of my works. Various commentators of Mezril's work have expressed his themes exhaustively, anti-war, anti-nationalist, anti-capitalist, anti-clergy. Human suffering, but also the basic goodness of man and the brotherhood of man. Philosophic sadness, but also heroic optimism. The influence of the big city on human life, a symbolic monster dominating our lives, he said. One other observer noted that Mezreel was a master of depicting crowds and masses in his work. He has been judged to be one of the most important graphic artists of the 20th century, and also been uh, termed to be the father of the modern graphic novel. Beyond that, I discovered a direct inspirational link between Mezreel and uh, what I consider uh, two of the most important modern and contemporary woodcut novelists, namely Lindward in the United States and George Walker in Canada. So we will now uh, view uh, The Passion of Man in 25 images. Whoops, wrong way, sorry. Oh, there is a photograph of Mays Real just to uh, give him his due. Um, now, his first graphic novel. It starts with um, a, a woman with an illegitimate pregnancy. The next scene is her father throwing, and, and notice, notice the, uh, you know, the, I'm not, I can't comment too much on technique, but, um, you know, the very straight, oh, and, the, and you know, I felt I was lucky because all the images are black and white and they come out very nicely, uh, but they, there's a certain jaggedness about them and emotion, full of emotion. There's the father throwing her out into the streets. And uh, there she is um, looking forward to a life of uh, poverty. Now the son, oh, there he is pissing on the sidewalk, I guess. He, um, uh, he lives on the streets. Uh, you know, he lives a rough life on the streets. Oh, um, I forget what that image is supposed to be. Um, I guess he has to labor to make his own way. That, that was one image I, I, I wasn't clear on. Um, there he is being kicked out of somewhere. And um, there he is, I think, stealing, uh, I believe, stealing a loaf of bread. And he's arrested. Notice, notice how uh, looming and um, 
I mean, those guys are scary looking, you know, they're the state. And uh, they've come after this boy and they arrest him. He ends up in, in prison. Uh, that must be when he is released. Oh yes, he's released from prison when he's older, of course. And then it, it shows him um, as a young man. Um, I'm not clear on what that scene is, but the next one is clear. He works and he works long hours to, to make a living. Although it doesn't, you can't get that from the image that he works long, but he works hard. Um, I guess that's another image showing that he, uh, you know, that the, his, the nature of his work and how hard it is. And he, uh, he, he's influenced by his buddies, his pals, and he, um, like them, um, what's it say here now? Uh, he, uh, lives, that's a prostitute, and he's with his pals having a great time, but he tires of that. Uh, he becomes tired of that life, and he looks for something more uh, solid in life, and there's a picture of him. He, he discovers books and reading, and he's reading, he's interested in ideas. He's so interested, of course, and I'm not sure what that one is. He must meet a, a decent woman for a change. But there he is, uh, rabble rousing, uh, trying, you know, trying to um, stir up the other workers um, against the capitalist bosses. And uh, he tries, he tries to convince, he tries to share his ideas with his uh, over one of his overmasters. And uh, he, he begins to foment a revolution. And he's arrested for that. Tried. And executed. So in 25 images, 1918, there's the date. Um, so that's, that's the first um, wordless novel. Now, I, I led you through it, so it wasn't too bad. But what if, what if the wordless novel was 80 to 100 images long and you didn't have someone uh, explaining some of the steps? Well, that raises for me, uh, what came, came out of this was uh, my central question about the wordless novel, I'm sure other people too. Um, and there have been negative responses about the wordless novel. Graphic novelist Will Eisner's criticism of the wordless novel is that they require, quote, considerable investment from readers in order to fill in the story between the images. And someone as astute as Northrop Fry, reviewing a wordless novel, noted that, quote, its continuity was a definite weak point. However, the great um, American wordless novelist, Lind Ward, who was actually a wood engraver, um, he acknowledges this problem of continuity when he states, quote, the test is uh, whether the narrative can be understood if the words are eliminated. Later in the same text, However, he more fully delineates the problem as he experienced it as an artist in producing this linear narrative. And this really um, does get into the working mind of, a, of the wordless novelist. The process has its difficulty and its hazards. The first visual units immediately establish character and setting. Each succeeding unit must relate to what has been established. And by focusing on a slightly later point in the developing action, move the story that much further along. 
the difficulty, of course, lies in determining how much of an interval between the images or units will be affected. If it is too great, you lose readers because they cannot make that leap with the information that you have given them. On the other hand, if the interval is too small or slight, the new unit will seem repetitious and the reader's interest will definitely flag. Now, uh, a couple of observers have given advice to um, readers of wordless novel. Um, someone as prestigious as Thomas Mann, the famous giant of German letters, um, offered these thoughts when he wrote an introduction to a 1948 reprint of Fan uh, Franz Masriel's wordless novel, Passionate Journey. Sit down with a book next to your reading lamp and concentrate on its pictures as you turn page after page. Don't deliberate too long. It is no tragedy if you fail to grasp every picture at once, just as it does not matter if you miss one or two shots in a silent movie. Um, of course, I think it's implied there that you read it, you go back and read it more carefully. Uh, a more uh, contemporary um, writer about this uh, subject, uh, Peter Cooper, in his introduction to a monograph entitled Wordless Books, offers this sage advice to readers of wordless novels. Uh, wordless picture stories have a unique and especially intimate relationship to their reader. In order to follow the narrative, these works ask the reader to decipher what has taken place and then connect the dots from one image to the next. Though these stories can be quickly scanned and comprehended, what they offer grows with repeated viewing. The more you scrutinize each image, the more information unfolds to you. The process is a, is a rewarding one as detailed as details unnoticed at first glance gain significance and express a world of meaning. And um, a couple of commentators mention the, the power of pictures over words. L Lawrence Hyde, another uh, very accomplished wordless novelist and Canadian, well, he was British at first, but then he came to Canada. Words are capable of expressing very complicated and very subtle notions, but for directness and universal interpretation, pictures under certain conditions are unrivaled. And Tom Smart discussing George Walker's work reminds us uh, of the often very compelling power of images. The images do the work of storytelling with a greater depth of expression and elusiveness than is perhaps generally possible through the written word. Uh, let's see. The next, the, the next, uh, the next giant after Mansreel is Lind Ward, nineteen oh five to nineteen eighty five, an American, and I'll show you some pictures of him. The, whoops, oh, I'm going the wrong way. Sorry. There he is. There's a photograph of him, the young Lind Ward. But I like the, uh, I like his own uh, drawing of himself. That's, that's his own wood engraving of, of himself. And uh, there's a picture of him later in life, and that's Lind Ward. He is the most prolific and influential of the American wordless novelists. Ward produced six published novels and one partially completed novel. In addition to this, he is a widely published illustrator of both adult and children's books. In fact, he illustrated over 100 books for children. He also wrote and illustrated his own children's book, The Biggest Bear, which I remember, but then I'm older than most of you, which won him a Caldecott Prize for his artistic endeavors. 
In high school, Ward first learned the art of printmaking through the medium of lino cuts. And at college, he continued his art studies while majoring in fine arts. After graduation, he has stated, the thing for young artists of the time to do was to travel to Europe to continue his studies immersed in the quote, mainstream of the art world. There he studied at the National Academy of Graphic Art in Leipzig. And there the story runs that in a bookshop in that city, he discovered Franz Maisreel and became immediately inspired by the format of the wordless novel. When Ward returned to the US, he produced his first wordless novel, God's Man, a work of some 139 engravings, which tells the story of an artist who sells his soul to the devil for artistic success. Now, before I, sh I'm not going to, sh I'm going to show you some images, but before a uh, little lesson on woodcuts versus wood engraving. There are at least three ways of creating illustrations for the wordless novel. The first is self-explanatory and that lino cuts obviously involve using a knife or a cutter on a piece of linoleum to create an image that can then be printed in ink. The other two methods, methods uh, you, uh, use wood as the medium and will require some explanation. The term woodcut involves using a cutter or a knife on what is called the plank side of the piece of wood. The side where the knife works along with the grain of the wood. So you're working with the grain. Wood engraving, however, involves the end of a block of wood and it cuts with a tool called a burin against the grain of the wood. You know, someone said you have to have a fairly large piece of wood to have a large end piece to work with. And, and, and why, why do I say this? Because one commentator explains that wood engraving allows the artist the ability to do much more intricate work with much finer tools. I mention this fact here because uh, American artist Lynn uh, Ward was a wood engraver rather than a wood cutter. And um, I'll show you some of his images and you'll see You'll see the, you know, they're quite, this is, oh, but then this is, um, again, bringing up the social theme. This is uh, the workers going to a, uh, again, the social consciousness, going to a communist meeting, socialist meeting, communist meeting. Um, I, I'm showing, this is, an, uh, the, left, the left side is a bit fuzzy because of the size of the book, but here is another, um, group of workers at a political meeting. And you can see the detail in his work. Uh, now the next two images are the state. And there is a very ominous looking representative of the state. And um, what do they do? Looks like the uh, Capitol building all over again. Um, so, um, there's the inter interest in social themes as well. Okay, what's next? Now we will, and I, I could spend a whole evening on Lind Ward, but of course this is more of an overview. The next artist is, uh, um, was British and moved to uh, Canada, Lawrence Hyde, uh, 1614 to 1987, 1914 to 1987. Lawrence Hyde was born in England, but moved to Canada in 1926. He studied art and subsequently made his living by doing advertising illustrations and by creating wood engravings and lino cuts for books. He held strong left-wing and pacifist views and created many illustrations for left-wing jour journals in Canada as well. His sole novel in woodcuts was inspired by his anger over American nuclear testing in the Bikini Atoll in the Pacific Islands in 1946, uh, following the atomic bombing in Japan. 
part of that testing involved evacuating villagers from the atoll before testing their nuclear weapons. And uh, oh, this was a nice. Oh, I brought a nice copy of it. Anyway, I'm not worried about that right now. Um, so let's show you a couple of images from Mr. Hyde's work. Oh, that's a picture of, of the gentleman. Probably a young picture of him. And uh, this, I, do, I only showed two images because of time restraints, but this is the happy family on the uh, island or atoll. And uh, this is what happens to the island a nuclear test. And before that, fortunately, they removed all the people, but it still, it shows the disruption and um, destruction of, of an island society. <laughs> now the next artist, I could, I, I, I could only come up with three artists that have produced more than one book. There may be others, but I, I only came up with three and one was Franz Maisreel, as I said, the other one was um, Lind Ward. And our own George Walker has produced six novels uh, in, in um, wood engravings. He was born in Brantford, Ontario in 1960, so he's still alive. Ward is dead, of course. But George uh, studied at the Ontario College of Art, is a letterpress printer, as well as a wood engraver and woodcut artist, has produced six full-length wordless novels, has also produced wood engravings for other fiction and nonfiction books, including Alice in Wonderland and the Woodcut Artist's Handbook, is an associate professor at the Ontario College of Art and Design, is the graphic novel acquisitions editor for the Canadian publisher, The Porcupine's Quill, and I will give you directions on how to look up the Porcupine's Quill um, novel, uh, graphic novels, um, wordless novels uh, later. He's a creative director for the Canadian publisher Firefly Books and is responsible for two wonderful books on uh, woodcut and wood engraving. Is a member of the Loving Society of Letterpress Printers, the Binders of Infinite Love, which I th I'd like to belong to that uh, rather than the Alkian Society. It just sounds like a nicer name. And the Canadian Book Binders and Book Artists Guild, uh, known as Cabbage. And he also has his own small private press called the Columbus Street Press. Now, Walker was influenced, you won't be surprised, by the work of Franz Maisreel, Lind Ward, and Lawrence Hyde. In fact, for the Maze Real influence, he explains in a book that he wrote, my fascination with the wordless novel began in the 1980s after attending an exhibition at the Art Gallery of Ontario featuring the work of Franz Maze Real, who is regarded as the first master of the wordless novel. After the exhibition, I began, an, I'm still quoting, after the exhibition, I began an obsessive pursuit to find books illustrated with woodcuts, wood engravings, and lino cuts, and to learn everything I could about the fine art of printmaking and the art of wood engraving. Uh, that pursuit led to his uh, most welcome discovery of the influential work on the wordless novel by both Lind Ward and Lawrence. Hyde. Uh, I guess Mays Real was the first influence. Now, as far as themes go, Walker clearly states himself that as I learned about the history of printmaking, I was struck by how often the woodblock print has been used over the years as a tool of social change and revolution. In my own small way, I joined that long tradition. But it is of great interest to me that although his first wordless novel does deal with the catastrophic social disruption brought about by the 9-11 uh, terrorist attacks in the US. His subsequent works uh, deal with what are to me more biographical subjects, 
uh, incidents from the lives of famous Canadians, the painter Tom, uh, Tom Thompson, business mogul Conrad Black, singer and poet Leonard Cohen, Prime Minister uh, Pierre Trudeau, former Prime Minister, and silent film star Mary Pickford. I am very seriously hoping that uh, we can successfully cajole George into doing a later presentation for the Elkin Society that will deal with uh, the themes and techniques of his work. I turn now in a fit of shameless promotion and um, promoting uh, George's books for him, because uh, they're well worthwhile and worth having. And his first one, oops, there's a picture of him. It's the only color one. All the others are in black and white, so I, it shows my favoritism. And he's a very uh, spiffy looking dude. I, I had the good fortune of hearing him speak when he was in Vancouver, where I bought a lot of his books. So here's his first one, The Book of Hours, 99 Wood Engravings. Oh, and he, I can't go into it in great length, but all, all his books relate somehow to uh, the numbers. Well, for example, in, I think in uh, the Cohen book, on, uh, in honor of Cohen's 80th birthday, he produced 80 images. I think he often ties his books into some significant numerical factor in people's lives. But the book of ours, 2010, focuses on the time between the world before the 9-11 attacks and the world after. It takes us from September 10th, 2001, until the morning of September 11th. The September 10th images observe various Americans going about a typical day. And there, there are times throughout the wordless novel that have significance. Uh, I think they show that you know, the time is passing. But I've, I've chosen for each of these books, including a couple by other Canadian um, wordless novels, um, I've chosen one, what I call one positive image. And there's the positive image before 9-11, of course, of people enjoying uh, perhaps a um, drink uh, with friends. And then uh, one negative image, and that is one that's etched in all of our minds. Uh, we'll never forget that image. His second book was The Mysterious Death of Tom Thompson, 2012. It was the true story of the circumstances surrounding Tom Thompson's, well, no, the true story of the circumstances surrounding Tom Thompson's death may never be known. One such theory is present, uh, presented in this book, um, his book, which <laughs> uh, in his book, um, that he resulted as a, died as a result of injuries sustained during a fight, a fist fight or a, a, a rumble with another man. Uh, on the positive side, the book is the story of an artist and his search for meaning through his experiences with the natural world. And uh, that image comes up first. There's the cover image and there's Tom. Thompson uh, portaging his canoe uh, in, uh, I forget whether, whether it was Algonquin Park or not, but anyway, there he is in the outback. And then there's the image of the fight that uh, is posited as one possible explanation for his death. The cover of the next one is The Life and Times of Conrad Black. The Rise and Fall of Media Baron Conrad Black. It's an attempt by George to go beyond the limitations to capture the man behind the mask. It is also an object lesson on how to read images and interpret true meaning of the story of a man, not from what we are told, but from what we see. And again, I, I 
not very cleverly uh, show one positive image. And I think that's when he received, um, I can't remember if it's called the Lordship, but anyway, you can see he's wearing, uh, uh, maybe he was knighted, I forget the, the details. And uh, the next image uh, is sad, but it strikes me as humorous too. And that is uh, Conrad Black when he was convicted and uh, sentenced to prison, uh, sweeping out a prison cell. The next book is The Wordless Leonard Cohen. The book was an 80th birthday present to Leonard Cohen, a tribute to his novels, poetry, and music, and the popular culture that surrounds him. As commentator Norman Ravin suggests, suggests in an introduction to this book, he's, this is, he gives advice on how to read it. Look, slowly, with the room arranged and the music just so, the words will come rushing at you almost too many at once. And uh, most of the images, in fact, 99% of them are very positive. But uh, you have to you actually actually get the maximum out of, out of these biographical ones, particularly Conrad Black and Leonard Cohen, you need to be able to recognize some of the pictures and the images. So um, I, I could do that, but um, I'm trying to think of who the other singer was. Um, that's gone anyway. Uh, so the first image is, and that's, a gra that's one of that'll stay in our minds too, of Leonard Cohen singing, uh, playing guitar. I could only find one negative image in the whole book, and it's not even that negative, and that is him at the end of his years and a nurse administering some kind of medicine to him. But basically, the, the uh, book is just filled with positive images. Um, Joni, Joni Mitchell is the one I was thinking of. If you, do, if you didn't know who Joni Mitchell was, that image might not be as informative to you as might be. Um, the next one that George did, oh, night 2015, is Trudeau, La Vie en Rose. And there are three introductions. One of them is by the young Trudeau for, about his father, Justin. And um, Walker chose Trudeau in his own words, because I associate the 1980s in Canada with Trudeau, because he symbolized the changing times and our hopes for a future. Interestingly enough, he comes to the aid of, and this is interesting because it does relate back to the whole question about how easy it is to follow the wordless novel. But it's interesting that um, George uh, Walker comes to the aid of the reader, but by providing a 15 page chronology of the events in Trudeau's life as an appendix to this book. So that seems to be a bit of, giving a bit of a help to the reader. What are the images? Oh, there we are, another canoeing image. Canadians seem to be happiest when they're in, out in the wilderness paddling their canoes. Um, what's the negative image? Eh, War Measures Act. That was a difficult time and a controversial time. Now I got uh, George's latest book, Mary Pickford, Queen of the Silent Film Era, just, just arrived recently. And George said, I chose Mary Pickford as a subject for a wordless novel because of my interest in Canadian and Canadian born artists. And Pickford was a silent film star. But I, I, I learned already from this that she was also involved in film management and production. And she was involved in, uh, in later in her life in charitable work for people from in the movie industry and also in saving old silent films. So uh, her life was much richer than I had imagined. And maybe that's part of the point of the wordless novel. In a, but I also noted a little bit of help for the reader here in, in, in a nod 
to the art of the silent film, Walker intersperses his wood engravings with the type of intertitles so often found in these films. Uh, and um, it actually helps the reader. There's a wonderful picture of, um, yeah, but the, 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 the next, see the caption helps you here because uh, it says a rowdy merry delights, and, and this is typical right out of motion pictures, a rowdy merry delights audiences by playing a tomboy in the 1926 film, Little Annie Rooney. So um, if you're challenged as a reader, there's a little bit of help for you. Those are George's six graphic uh, wordless novels to date. And, uh, but there are other Canadians. Uh, I think probably George has influenced his students in, in this direction. But I think this next person, one of these next people was a, um, a student with George. And I'm not sure, I can't remember which was which, but so there are other Canadian uh, and you'll see, you'll see um, people who have done single wordless novels when you go to the uh, Porcupine's Quill uh, wordless novels. And here's the first one uh, by Tony Miller. And it is, um, oh, I, I thought, it, okay. The Life of Daddy Hall is the story of a man reaching out for freedom and social justice in the wake of his struggle against slavery and personal loss before finally escaping by way of the famous Underground Railroad to finally settle in Owen Sound, Ontario, where he find, found freedom and a sense of community and uh, his own uh, self-dignity. Um, so some images. There's the negative image. Oh, I guess I only showed one image I, uh, for time reasons, but there is the, uh, a very striking image of um, part of slavery. And the next um, single one is by Stefan Berg. Uh, this this uh, chronicles the uh, exuberant life, but very sad ending of the life of the New Orleans jazz great Buddy Bolden. And uh, if you're a jazz buff, you'll know that name. And I only, uh, I have one image and that is the, the brass band marching along. That's, uh, that's a great image. Um, now, um, all of these works and indeed other wordless novel titles are available to interested readers and collectors by doing a very simple Google search. And here, I mean, I've been extolling the virtues of George Walker, but we must extol the virtues of Porcupine's Quill uh, for producing uh, wonderful wordless novels, but also many, many other novels with text and uh, poetry books, uh, a terrific publisher. They have received, um, an Alcuin Lifetime Achievement Award, uh, Award for the Book Arts, as George will probably someday. Um, but if you want to uh, follow this up and see a, a real uh, treasure trove of the Canadian uh, wordless novels, just Google this, Porcupine's Quill Wordless Novels. Porcupine's Quill wordless novels. Um, okay. I don't know how to get out of the images. How do I get out of the images? I want to get out of the images. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> well, Richard, thank you so much. That was fun. It's fantastic. Um, we do have a couple of uh, questions in the chat, and uh, at this point, I encourage anyone who has any questions for Richard to uh, please please uh, pose your questions in the chat, and and I'll and I'll get to them. Uh, one right off the bat is to do with uh, George Walker's biographies. Uh, 
Are the uh, George Walker biographies printed via letterpress in limited editions, or are they available in mass market versions? Oh, I should have mentioned that, of course. Uh, yes, they are. I mean, I did not purchase the limited editions. I bought the uh, uh, wonderful paperback um, versions published by Porcupine's Quill, and they're quite reasonably priced. So, no, I would like to be able to uh, own the limited editions, that's for sure. But um, I mentioned earlier, there are financial constraints and <laughs> constraints of space. So, but anyway, uh, the, the, the Porcupine's Quill, I mean, they do such exquisite work that they're a pleasure to own and read. What are some uh, what are some titles that uh, you you know uh, money not an object that you would really like in your in your collection of uh, of wordless novels? Oh my gosh! Well, George's limited editions, obviously. I I did I did manage to get a reprint of Fa Franz Mays Reel's uh, second novel. I bought it from a local bookseller who's going out of business and. Um, it's got an introduction by Thomas Mann, and I'm really happy to have that. I also have another book that he illustrated uh, uh, from the same source. Uh, it smelled very musty, but I have taken care of that. There's a way of getting that musty smell out of books. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But uh, my my big hunt right now is I have the uh, there's it's a rare it's a scarce novel. It, um, Ah, it's so scarce, I forget the author. <laughs> but um, ah, it's gone. Never mind. Sheila Watson's the uh, Sheila Watson's uh, novel, The Double Hook. Mm. I have a signed first edition, uh, but the dust jacket is terrible. Uh, and so I'm looking for an unsigned one so I can marry the two. Mm. <laughs> um, you know, some of the examples you were showing, uh, Mazril's work, Lynn Ward, um, you know, Jeff uh, Walker's work, or uh, George Walker's work, you know, th it seems like there's this intimate relationship between, uh, you know, reportage or almost like a political uh, commentaries and, and these wordless novels, uh, you know, particularly with Mizril and, and Ward, they're, they're often kind of socialist commentaries. Why do, you think there is that, why do you think there is that connection between um, that that medium and 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 those sorts of uh, ideas? It's probably when it started during the expressionist period in Germany and life was difficult. I mean, I I don't know a hundred percent, but it had something to do with well a lot of a lot of them were left wingers you know and uh, they were fed up with the capitalist state and fascism and but uh, I, I don't know why so many gravitated that way we have a question that's come in uh, and it's a technique question or technical question uh, uh, did Ms. Rill, uh cut on wood or on a lead base well, he, he he was a woodcut artist, and he on so he carved on the plank of the wood, not the end of the wood. His his uh, cuts are a bit. I mean, I I think I think it's true. Wood engravings are you can get a little more fine detail with wood engravings. Uh, woodcuts tend to be a bit rough, but I think that's part of their appeal to me anyway. Is the I mean, uh, my big discovery out of this, aside from, well, I mean, my big discovery was going back to expressionism, and uh, I have, I have, I just happened to purchase a collection from a lady that had a bunch of expressionist art in it, and I, uh, I was quite taken with the, they're not, they're not in wordless novels, there's they're in other novels or they're prints that are redone and they're, they're pretty, uh, they're, they're pretty, they grab you, you know, they're pretty strong images. Uh, I don't like them all, but uh, I like a lot of them. Uh, very strong, very strong uh, form of art. 
Are there, uh, you, are you finding any, uh, any artists, uh, any publishers at present that are, are doing work in this milieu that, that you're really intrigued by? Well, you know what? I don't know why, but people have gravitated to the, the graphic novel with text. I mean, that seems to be dominating the market. Uh, there aren't too many people like George who have enough courage to, to do the wordless novel, you know? I mean, the people capitulate and maybe it's for market reasons. They, they, they take, they do a novel with illustrations and text. Mm -hmm. It's just easier. People find it easier, I guess. That's I don't know I'm... if we, you would think we would be able to read pictures, but maybe we're not trained that much to read pictures. Uh, Alberta Manguel has a book on how to read pictures. Mm. Um, I don't know. It would be interesting to know what, see what the artist says. I'm, I, I am hoping sincerely that George will eventually uh, give a talk and go in greater depth about his uh, technique and his themes and his interests. Uh, he did give the talk in Vancouver, but uh, on a Zoom talk, we could reach a big audience. And I think it'd be a natural follow-up to my uh, amateur <laughs> overview. Hmm. Yeah, that would be a, certainly a treat. Yeah. Um, you know, it's an interesting, you, you, you were reading some, uh, some critical responses, uh, some commentaries about the, uh, the wordless novel. And yeah. uh, there's this comment about uh, the interval you know, the space between one image and another. Exactly, exactly. And, and this relationship, it's so interesting to see you know, woodblocks and, and their close connection with, in a way, cinema or cinematic thinking. Oh, I think that's one of the past, the silent film. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I think, yeah. No, it's great. Uh, now, we have another comment uh, from, from uh, ex officio member uh, Chester Grisky about a possible omission of Aphrodite's cup. <laughs> Who did that? Or, or remain silent to that one. Who did that? It, I, it rings a bell, but I can't place it. Um, George Cuthun. Oh, George Cuthan. Yeah. George Cuthan. You just don't find much about him, you know, like um, I should check, see if there's anything on the internet. That's so yeah, it's an obvious oversight. I didn't, what I, I didn't show too many woodcut, wordless novels that only had one novel. I, there were others too. There was, there was a contemporary of um, Franz Maisreel that did, did one Otto Nuckel, I think his name is, but um, I, I wasn't sure of the time factor. Well, I mean, thank you so much for taking the time to make sort of selections and, and, and present this, uh, this broad view of, of, this, of this form. Um, we have one question here coming in. Uh, it, reading pictures is important, uh, but does that necessarily mean that the viewer has the background to understand symbols? example, the hammer and sickle, um, or know enough history to understand the message? Well, it is a challenge. No, it's a distinct challenge. I mean, for example, in all of George's biographical ones, uh, if you don't know a little bit about the person, like say the Trudeau thing, uh, if you didn't know about the War Measures Act, you would be puzzled by that image, you know, uh, and Conrad Black, I mean, all of them, all of them. I mean, uh, and I mentioned Leonard Cohen, if you didn't know that um, it was Joni Mitchell, you'd, you, know, <laughs> you would lose something from the experience, I think. So yeah, I know it's, uh, it's a bit of a challenge um, for the wordless novelist to, I, I'm not sure how, how they solve it. Oh, well, I, I mentioned a couple of ways. George did provide the, uh, the um, uh, 
what's it called now? Timeline. The, I think there was a timeline with the truth. The timeline in the back of the book uh, gives you a lot of, you know, sort of orients you a little bit to to some of the images. And, and then those, um, like the Mary Pickford, the little silent film squibs on the opposite page, uh, they're actually on the uh, recto page. Um, and the images on the verso, but uh, they help you too. I mean, uh, so uh, I don't, I, I, I'm not sure George added those things to help the reader, you know, consciously to help the reader, mm -hmm. yeah. realizing that it, it, they are a challenge sometimes to follow. Well, like, like in, uh, Conrad Black, if you didn't know who Barbara Emil was, you'd miss a lot. <laughs> those, a lot of those images might not mean much. Yeah, very it's a specific readership for sure. Well, Richard, thank you so much for taking the time to put this presentation together. And, uh, and thank you everyone for, for attending this evening's uh, lecture. We will, uh, we'll, be, uh, we'll be taking a break for the summer. However, we'll be back in, uh, in September. And we're quite excited. Uh, Thursday, September 16th, we'll have uh, Andrew Steves, uh, printer publisher Andrew Steves. Um, and he will also be in conversation with, uh, with the engraver illustrator, uh, Wesley Bates, about their various collaborations um, uh, through the years. And uh, that registration will be up on our site and made available. Uh, and this talk as well will be made available through our YouTube channel uh, in, the, in the coming days. So if, if you think this will be of interest to, uh, to other people that you know uh, who are interested in, in this type of thing, uh, please feel free to uh, share it. Uh, again, thank you so much for, for the time and, and joining us this evening. Uh, stay safe and, uh, and all the best. Thank you. <laughs>